Hello, I'm Esther Gidu. You are it's Friday, October 15th. This is Africa 54. Could a new malaria vaccine save vulnerable children on the continent from the deadly mosquito-borne disease? Former South African president and human rights icon Nelson Mandela's belongings are put up for auction. And in our entertainment segment, big news from Northern Ghana. The World Health Organization's endorsement of the world's first malaria vaccine marks a major advance in the fight against the mosquito-borne illness, which annually kills 265,000 children in Africa. Timothy Obiezu reports from Nigeria. Beatrice Yusuf's three-year-old daughter and grandson recently came down with malaria. He says the mosquito-borne parasite that causes the disease is all too common at this Abuja camp for internally displaced people. And we go, to, we, we enter to bed, all is well, everybody well. But toward midnight, I had him shivering. As I thought his body very hot. So I wake, woke him up. Yusuf took the children to a local dispensary got some anti-malaria drugs and is now administering them at home. More than 90% of malaria cases and deaths worldwide occur in Africa, according to the World Health Organization. Nigeria accounts for more than a quarter of the fatalities. Children under five years old and pregnant women are mostly affected. Last week, the global health body endorsed the rollout of the world's first malaria vaccine, Moscurix, after more than three decades of development. WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said the vaccine could potentially change the course of public health history. Walter Kazadi Mulombo is the WHO representative in Nigeria. You know, before the vaccine could be introduced in the country, it has to be cleared by NAFTAC for the case of Nigeria, and there are steps to be taken so that uh, the country could um, approve the vaccine so the introduction uh, uh, could start. Some 2.3 million doses of the vaccine were administered to children in Malawi, Kenya and Ghana during a large-scale pilot program that began in 2019. The WHO says the vaccine could help prevent 4 in 10 cases of malaria, but Mulomba says widespread availability may prove difficult for now. There may be some supply issues, so it may not be in, a, in the quantity we require to reach all those that we need to reach. Uh, but we understand that GSK, with the, the manufacturer, is working already with, uh, with uh, some African countries to decentralize uh, production. The new vaccine will not replace other malaria preventive measures, says Abuja Health official Ndayo Iwat. So if you don't combine it with... Uh sleeping under the long acting insecticide nets and also taking care of the environment, uh, taking care of uh, puddles and where the vectors can breed, then uh, you are more like, likely to continue to have the scourge of malaria in this country. Pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline says it will manufacture about 15 million doses yearly, but experts say at least 50 to 100 million doses will be needed every year in areas with moderate and high transmission. In the meantime, Nigerian parents like Yusuf are hoping to get their children vaccinated as soon as possible. Timothy Yobiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. The World Food Programme warns it will be forced to start cutting food rations in a matter of weeks for 500,000 people suffering from acute hunger in northeast Nigeria unless it receives an immediate infusion of $55 million. Millions of people in Nigeria's crisis-ridden Borno, Yobe and Adamawa states are suffering from years of conflict, insecurity and the socio-economic fallout from COVID-19. 
WFP spokesman Thompson Peary says hunger is peaking now as the country emerges from the so-called lean season. That is the period between June and August when food stocks are at their lowest. Peary says attacks by armed groups are heightening insecurity in the region and discouraging people from working their land. The killing of a five-year-old girl by a military police officer has inflamed tensions in Cameroon's English-speaking southwest region where secessionists have been battling government troops for nearly five years. Clara Frank has the latest. Testers marched the body of a five-year-old girl through the streets of Cameroon's Buea on Thursday. She was killed, a senior official in the country's southwest region said, when a military police officer opened fire on a car at a checkpoint. It's an incident that highlights tensions and violence in Cameroon's two English-speaking regions. Hundreds of residents took to the streets, some carrying branches in a sign of peace. Others waved 500 CFA franc notes. That's how much they say the girl's parents refused to pay before the gendarme opened fire. This protester declined to give his name for security reasons. Secessionists have been battling government troops for nearly five years, fueled by a perception of marginalization by the country's French-speaking majority. Over 3,000 people have been killed and nearly a million displaced. In Buea, the girl's body was taken to the office of regional governor Bernard Okali Bilai. During the protest, residents were forced to take cover as sporadic gunfire erupted elsewhere in the town, according to a Reuters witness. It was unclear who was shooting. Clara Frank, VOA News. Kenyan police on Friday are still deciding where to arraign the husband of a record-smashing long-distance runner Agnes Tirop, who was found dead at her home Wednesday. Police arrested Ibrahim Rotich on Thursday in Mombasa. They say he was trying to flee the country. The director of criminal investigation says that Rotich will be arraigned to answer murder charges. A police official told reporters they are still investigating the murder and are weighing options to transport him back to the city of Eldoret where Tirop was killed. Kenyan law requires that a suspect be taken to court within 24 hours of arrest. Kenya is a major African player on the world geopolitical stage as evidenced by U.S. President Joe Biden's White House meeting with Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta on Thursday. This was Biden's first in-person talks with an African leader since becoming president. The U.S.-Kenya strategic partnership is essential. We both, I think, believe is essential to uh, addressing key regional and global challenges and I want to thank Kenya for your thank you for your leadership in uh, defending the peace security and democratic instincts of the region and your country the United States has done its best to step up in terms of not only helping Kenya but the African continent in general with regard to access to vaccines happy to hear you on your announcement of that increase because as many of you will know as a continent, we are lagging well behind the rest of the world in terms of being able to uh, um, vaccinate our people. The White House says the two leaders also discussed their shared commitment to defending democracy and human rights, advancing regional peace and security, and accelerating economic prosperity through climate smart solutions and the use of renewable energy resources. Kenyan authorities say the COVID-19 pandemic's economic impact is driving more people to fish illegally. Poaching has tripled since last year and caused the daily catch to drop from an estimated 600 tons to 200 tons, according to Kenya's Maritime Fisheries Research Institute. As a result, the Coast Guard is being deployed to protect lakes from poachers. Victoria Munga reports from Naivasha. 
For three decades, Seremaya Olo has relied on Kenya's Lake Naivasha for his livelihood as a fisherman. Yeah. But since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, his catch has been dropping continually. Olo is convinced that is because of an increasing number of illegal fishing boats on the lake. Back then I could catch at least 1,000 pieces of tilapia, but now catching just a under tilapia is very difficult. As a fish community, we see the number of boats is increasing. COVID-19 has disrupted many livelihoods, with more than 1.7 million people losing their jobs since the pandemic began. According to Kenya's national statistics, officials with Kenya's Marine and Fisheries Research Institute say they believe people affected by the pandemic have turned to fishing to help them survive. The institute's coordinator, Edna Waidera, told VOA that poachers are having a negative impact on breeding areas. Fishing is normally undertaken around the breeding areas, which are the shallow areas of the lake. So this destroys these breeding areas, which are critical refugia or critical habitats for uh, breeding of the fish and taking care of the young the fish. To protect the young fish populations, the Coast Guard has been dispatched to the lakes to stop illegal fishing. We even have uh, fisheries officers from Kenya Fisheries Service who are seconded uh, to Coast Guard. So that when it comes to issues to do with fisheries enforcement, because we even have got areas that are protected for breeding, we have got uh, the bit of uh, um, uh, and, uh, preventing people who go and use illegal uh, fishing gears. With the deployment of monitors on Kenyan lakes, licensed fishermen like Seremaya hope that fish populations and their livelihoods will bounce back. Victoria Amunga for VO News, Naivasha, Kenya. Zimbabwe is cracking down on its government workers. According to an official circular, officials are barring unvaccinated workers from reporting for duty beginning on Monday as part of the country's efforts to fight COVID-19. Those barred from work will not get paid according to a cabinet directive. As of October 14th, Zimbabwe has had recorded over 4,600 COVID-19 related deaths from more than 132,000 infections since March 2020. Although Zimbabwe was one of the first countries in Africa to vaccinate against COVID-19, less than 2.5 million people out of its 15 million people have been fully vaccinated. President Joe Biden is expressing optimism about the progress the U.S. is making against COVID-19. Recent polls show that his standing with the American public is linked with the state of the pandemic in the country. VOA White House Bureau Chief Patsy Widakuswara explains. With his legislative agenda on infrastructure and social spending in limbo, on Thursday, President Joe Biden touted progress in the country's fight against the pandemic. Nationally, daily cases are down 47 percent. Hospitalizations are down 38 percent over the past six weeks. Over the past two weeks, most of the country has improved as well. Case rates are declining in 39 states, and hospital rates are declining in 38 states. Assuring Americans that his administration is succeeding in the fight against the pandemic is key to Biden's political viability. When the vaccine effort was being pretty successful in the, in the spring, we saw his favorability numbers continue to be pretty high. But with the Delta variant and the spike in cases and sort of the resurgence in COVID we've seen over the last couple of months, we've seen Biden losing ground. The withdrawal from Afghanistan, rising gas prices and inflation, and the surge of migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border are contributing factors to Biden's poll numbers sliding. But pollsters say the pandemic is the key driver. 49.7% of Americans disapprove of the job Biden is doing, compared with 44.7% who approve, according to 538's presidential approval tracker. His poll numbers have been below 50% for a while. Since August 30th, more Americans have disapproved of the president than have approved of him. It's a bad sign for Democrats as the country heads into the 2022 midterm elections. The midterm elections are usually a referendum on the current administration. Uh, so it makes a huge difference for Republican fortunes if 
Joe Biden's job approval is 55 versus 35. The White House has blamed COVID case numbers in part to Republicans' resistance to public health measures, including Republican governors blocking Biden's mandate, requiring vaccination or weekly testing for employees of large companies, federal workers and contractors. Governor Abbott's executive order uh, banning mandates, and I would also note announcement by Governor DeSantis this morning, essentially banning the implementation of mandates, uh, fit a familiar pattern uh, that we've seen of putting politics ahead of public health. Pollsters say voters don't care who is at fault. For a lot of Americans, they don't feel like COVID's under control. Why that's happened isn't necessarily material. Biden's the president, so Biden's responsible at the end of the day. Biden again pleaded for the 66 million unvaccinated Americans to get their shots and called on businesses to step up and back his vaccine mandates. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. We would like to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, in our entertainment report, we have exciting music news to share with you from northern Ghana. Stay with us. Sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Mudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. Welcome back to Africa 54. The family of former South African President Nelson putting roughly 100 of his belongings, including some of his iconic shirts, up for auction to help fund a memorial garden in his honor. David Doyle has the details. It's the trademark clothing of an iconic leader. And now Nelson Mandela's exuberant shirts are among around 100 of his possessions being put up for auction. The items are being sold by the family of the late South African president to help fund a memorial garden. The Nelson Mandela Freedom Garden will be located in Kunu in South Africa's Eastern Cape, where the anti-apartheid leader is buried. His daughter, Dr. Makaziwe Mandela, says she feels a responsibility to fulfill her father's wish of generating tourism in that area. Yeah, it is uh, hard, but uh, at the same time, um, when it comes to the sheds, and my father had lots of sheds, lots of lots of sheds. <laughs> The shirts going under the hammer were worn on formal occasions, including to meet Britain's Queen Elizabeth. Ten of the shirts are on display at the New York Fashion Institute of Technology's museum for three weeks. The museum's deputy director, Patricia Mears. These shirts, the Madiba shirts, are much more than a fashion statement. They are about our entire world, how we view the world, how we want to advance our society and our cultures. The auction is being held live and online by New York-based Guernseys. Its president, Arlen Ettinger, said one of the lots is a four-page letter written by Mandela while he was imprisoned on Robben Island. You can see uh, how patiently he wrote this out. And then here it is, the stamp from Robben Island Prison. The letter was written to uh, the commanding officer of Robben Island Prison. 
Other belongings being sold include gifts from former US President Barack Obama and other world leaders, as well as Mandela's briefcases and glasses. David Doy of Reuters filed that report. The Pan-African Film Festival of Ouagadougou returns to Burkina Faso Saturday after being cancelled last year due to the COVID pandemic. One Burkinabe director who has made a film documenting a nursery for the infants of sex workers talks about the importance of telling African stories through cinema. Henry Wilkins reports from Ouagadougou. Mamune Sano is a documentary film director from Bobo Dioulasso, Burkina Faso, Second City. In 2019, he made a film which is to be screened at the Pan-African Film and Television Festival of Ouagadougou, or FESPACO, which begins on Saturday. Night Nursery follows the story of an older woman who runs a nighttime home for sex workers' children in Bobo Dioulasso. Sanu says he wants Night Nursery to humanise sex workers. The idea for me is to show another image of these sex workers, which is very rarely seen. I know that here at home and in the rest of Africa, this profession is frowned upon, but it is also the oldest profession in the world. When we see these girls, people say they are bad people because they are sex workers. Fespaco has been running since 1969, and this year will feature films from around 30 African countries in its official selection. Cinema professionals and cinephiles travel from all over Africa and beyond to attend. FESPACO is one of the biggest African film festivals, and for me to be selected and represent Burkina Faso in the documentary film section will be seen by the whole world, not just Africans. The director of FESPACO says that this year the event will also host the African international film and TV market, known as MICA, for the first time. Because this year the MICA will be held here at FESPACO, we have invited platform leaders. I prefer not to mention names who will come to Wagadogio to find new projects that are in post-production and also films that are already finished but not scheduled for FESPACO so that they can fit their platforms. Last year, FESPACO, which usually happens every two years, was cancelled due to COVID-19. Burkina Faso is also in the midst of a conflict with terror groups linked to Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Burkina Faso's culture minister says it's important the festival goes ahead anyway. It is a challenge for the Burkinabe to continue to be able to revive this Africa cinema every two years, which is the cinema through which we can see the vision of Africans and the people who live on this continent. And I believe that all those who preceded me made sure that this cinema and all those who lived here in Burkina Faso found a common point of the African people. As for Sanu, he's hoping Night Nursery could receive an award and the recognition it needs to win a wide audience. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. In today's entertainment report, we have big music news from Northern Ghana. De Bourne has a new chief of the talking drum. Mohamed Alidu speaks with Heather Maxwell to share his news and music from Tamale. Hello, Mohamed Alidu. How are you? Good. How are you too? I'm fine. Tell me what is uh, your news? You just released a new album. Yes, the new one that just coming out is called Yet and I. Yet an eye. What does that mean? Yet an eye is the truss is gone. The truss is finished. When you cry, you know, you want somebody to listen to your pain, your sadness, your, you know, to comfort you, to give you the pep talk. But today, you don't, we don't have that. You know, do you remember when I was there and, um, we had a fun jam. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> this song is someone who said more, but someone is coming. When you come into a country, the most important thing to be honest and be calm. When you are safe, so more about as a stranger, you should play your, you should be humble and see how people need for you to so find a choice. How's 
be Zoom school going? Well, everything is going great and the school is going fantastic because uh, this year we did, after we do our play for change day, we have more opportunities to reach out to more people outside Ghana. This morning I was rewarded by the king in, in, in the power that has achieved drama for that. And uh, also the, 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 the Minister of Culture and the Minister of Tourism were connecting to, uh, to coordinate together, to work together with the music that I do and what I have been doing outside Ghana, reaching out to different communities in that they are from Ghana and New York, the Nagoma community in New York and Atlanta. All of them are working with them in that. Congratulations on your, your new chieftaincy. It was that to, to appoint me and give me the polar lot. So that will be next time I have to prepare a time that will be flexible and for you, friends and family. Thank you so much for joining me today, especially on the day that you awarded your chieftaincy. <laughs>